damaging? Surely it's just common sense. Extra pay seems to be a good incentive to get people to work better. If you want a horse to move, you dangle a carrot in front of its face. <laughs> Bonuses, commissions. They work in the world of business, so damn right they should work in schools too. But the truth is, they don't, even in many areas of business. This debate is really about human motivation. Are we motivated extrinsically by tangible rewards like pay and carrots, or are we motivated intrinsically by purpose and wanting to make a dent in the universe, as Steve Jobs said? Sure, Steve Jobs wanted to make money, but it isn't the thing that drove him on every day. He wanted to make a difference to the world, just like teachers do. I want to tell you a story taken from a brilliant book called Drive by Daniel Pink. Imagine it's 1995, and you ask an economist to peer into the future. You describe two encyclopedias and ask them to predict which will be more successful. The first encyclopedia is by Microsoft, one of the most successful companies on the planet. You explain that Microsoft will pay professional writers to create thousands of articles. The second encyclopedia won't come from a company. It'll be created by tens of thousands of people who write articles for fun. And get this, no pay. So you ask the economists, in 15 years, one of these encyclopedias will be the largest, most popular in the world, and the other will be defunct. Which will be which? Using usual motivational theory, any economist at the time would have thought the question a joke. Microsoft was the obvious winner. But that isn't what happened, is it? On October 31st, 2009, Microsoft pulled the plug on MSN and Carter. Meanwhile, Wikipedia has become the largest, most popular encyclopedia in the world. At Michaela, we question everything. Is marking necessary? Do graded observations make sense? Does the carrot and stick method of using pay to get your people to work better actually work? At Michaela, we are, of course, in favor of teachers being paid decent professional salaries. The only reason Wikipedia, Firefox, Linux, and various other companies have had such success with their volunteer workforce is because they had paying jobs elsewhere. But the research shows that if people have good basic salaries, bonuses can be damaging to the ethos of your organization and negatively affect the behavior of your staff. There is overwhelming evidence in behavioral science that shows that money does not sharpen thinking or accelerate creativity. In fact, it does just the opposite. It dulls thinking and blocks creativity. And frankly, there are many businesses who use the stick carrot method to motivate their people, and they shouldn't. Bosses choose to ignore the evidence because changing the way we think, questioning the assumptions we have made for decades is hard. There are some uses of financial incentives in teaching that are legitimate and should not be confused with performance-related pay. For example, using money to attract teachers in shortage subjects. This is an acknowledgement of the reality of today's labor market in which, say, scientists have an attractive alternative. But this is not performance-related pay, which is about measuring the performance of individual teachers. The clue, ladies and gentlemen, is in the title. That's right. Performance-related pay demands a performance from people instead of real improvement. And boy, will they perform when the people in charge of their pay are watching. Money, money will motivate people. Of course it will. It will motivate them to cheat, to show off, to pretend, and to sabotage others. How many of you have ever done something because it's the right thing to do? Funny, was there no payment involved? And how many of you have ever tried to learn an instrument or, or a new language or, or a new sport in your spare time? Oh, were you planning a career in this to earn some extra money? Or are you just human? Meaning that you do things for a variety of reasons, often none of them having anything to do with money. Let me tell you about some daycares in Israel. A few parents were turning up late at the end of the day to pick up their kid, and it meant that staff had to waste time for the, waiting for them to arrive. So staff thought, how can we stop these parents from turning up late? I know, let's charge the parents. Makes sense. The result was that this led to nearly twice the number of parents picking up their children late. Why? Because before, the parents picked up their kids on time because there was a moral obligation to do so. 
You were letting somebody down if you turned up late. Once you charge people, it suddenly makes it okay to pick up your children late. Money killed intrinsic motivation in these parents, and it will kill it for teachers. Leave performance-related pay out of the mix, and teachers will want to improve because they are human and they're intrinsically motivated to do so. Teaching is a team sport. Not that Michael Gove would know this. You remember him. He was the education secretary. <laughs> and you know, I love him dearly. I love him so much that people actually said that I named the school after him. <laughs> but poor guy. I mean, he has no idea what it is to be a teacher, nor does he know what it is to work in a team. Gove worked in the world of journalism, where performance-related pay works. In business, performance-related pay works well when there is a simple set of rules and a clear goal to pursue, where focusing the mind on achieving simple targets is what you want. You want your car salesman to sell as many cars as possible. You want your toothbrush factory worker to make as many toothbrushes as possible. Sell a car, make a toothbrush, ka-ching, you get paid. It can even work when the employees are interchangeable, say with insurance companies or banking, and it doesn't matter to the bosses whether or not there is consistency of staff, and long-term motivation is not required. But schools will always need consistency and teamwork because they are the bread and butter of school success. You cannot swap your teachers in and out like you can with bankers or journalists because children build relationships with their teachers and for the most part work hard and succeed thanks to those long-lasting relationships. Sorry. I'll give you three reasons why performance-related pay doesn't work in schools. One, as I said, teachers work as a team. A head of a department might support less experienced teachers by taking on more challenging children into her class. Head of department and teacher share resources. They achieve common whole school goals through cooperating. Establish a culture where it's every man for himself, where that head of department may very well lose out on her 500 pounds at the end of the year, and she'll stop helping the weaker staff. Her results won't be as good. She'll appear more chaotic and disorganized. There isn't any way of measuring the exact effect, if only there were. Two, performance-related pay works well when it is easy to measure performance. Ten cars sold is better than five. But with teaching, you don't always get the same output from the same input. Children are not predictable, and classes even less so. Remove one or two miscreants from a troublesome class, and it can be transformed into a team of high achievers. It's very difficult to judge the impact of one teacher. There is so much that influences the success of a child that it's impossible to measure the impact of each thing. There are private tutors hired by parents, parents who listen to advice and learn how to support their child, others who damage their children by doing the wrong things, peer influence, both good and bad, and then teacher influence from across the school, not just the teacher teaching that subject. Some classes, have an excellent form tutor or head of year who always checks in on their behavior and inspires them. Other classes aren't so lucky. I could go on. What happens when the teacher is given a new GCSE group from year 10 that's been badly taught for the last three years? And what about those teachers who don't have any exam groups? And what about the teachers who the head rarely sees? How do you judge their performance? Through line managers? Three, performance-related pay depends on a target culture and creates tons of bureaucracy. Line managers have to have more meetings. God, let me slip my throat. To discuss... <laughs> to discuss targets. Lord, have mercy. Targets now are our focus, and when you want simple tasks done, they work. Toothbrushes, cars, but creativity, teaching, the answers are not necessarily in the box. When bus drivers were measured and ranked according to the time they spent on their routes, they stopped picking up passengers. There you were. <laughs> there you were, thinking that the point of the bus service was to actually use the bus. But the bus driver forgets all of that because he's been set a target. You'll remember how hospitals were set targets to get patients into beds. So what did they do? They took the wheels off trolleys. Hey, presto, you've got a bed. 
Your target as a teacher is to pull out results with your year 11 class. So you forget your key stage three classes so that in three years time, some other teacher is chasing her tail, trying to achieve her target of X number of C grades with her year 11 class, which in fact used to be your ignored key stage three class. Short term goals don't work. Targets are evil and performance related pay depends on line managers implementing targets. In Jonathan's policy exchange report to government recommending the introduction of performance related pay into schools, it's all his fault, <laughs> they, they say it's straightforward to measure teacher performance. Just do graded observations. Oh yes, we all know how simple and fair those are. <laughs> Analyze their pupils' exam results. All right, because you want a culture where pupils don't feel responsible for their own results. And get this, ask the pupils whether they think the teacher is any good. <laughs> Do that, and you have targets galore mixed in with the perfect recipe to destroy any school, putting children in charge of the careers of their teachers. In the interest of fairness, I'm going to give Jonathan 11 minutes. <laughs> she was, all, however, on the last page. So I, I and, and she employs me. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to oppose the motion, Jonathan Simons. I think there we have a classic, classic example of a perverse incentive there. Um, Thank you very much. It's, it's a great pleasure to be here, and it's lovely to, to be here in City Hall. And wasn't it lovely that we, had a, we sort of started with a message from Boris Johnson? I thought it was a really sort of nice way to start the day off. And of course, he said that, you know, maybe one day someone around here could be mayor. And, and Catherine said that maybe it could be her. And I have, I have to be honest, Catherine, I'm really sorry. You may not be half Kenyan, but you are half West Indian. So according to Boris Johnson, you have no chance of doing anything successful in life. Um, <laughs> that was a joke. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's also good, of course, to be at City Hall. Uh, people say things about their pets uh, and owners. They start to look like each other. I wonder where the buildings start to represent the mayor. So here we are in what is undoubtedly a priapic building for a priapic mayor. Um, I wonder if we come to City Hall next year, whether we'll be debating in a wind turbine, uh, if it's Zach, or according to the Evening Standard, we'll be amongst the domes and minarets of a fundamentalist mosque uh, if we're under Sadiq Khan. Um, but nevertheless, uh, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here to talk about the issue of performance-related pay. And possibly the most hackneyed phrase in education policy, um, other than, my God, policy exchange with an awful right-wing think tank, um, the most hackneyed thing that's said in education policy is that a school system cannot exceed the quality of its teachers. And if that's true, why don't we act like it? Why don't we act like we ought to respect our teachers? Why don't we act like we should have a system that values teachers properly? Why instead does so much of what we do treat teachers like widgets in a widget factory, or like people who do produce tubes of toothpaste, or like bus drivers whose sole job is to pick up passengers? Now, what performance-related pay means to me is a system of matching pay to skill and to performance. That's it. How you do it is up for debate. I'm not quite sure I did endorse graded lesson observations, but if I did, I then wrote a report six months later saying they were terrible. Uh, so apart from anything else, you can see people have flexibility in the way they change their minds. But all performance-related pay is, is about recognizing skill and recognizing performance and valuing it accordingly. And the irony, of course, that even before performance-related pay came in, this principle was well established in the school system. So 85% of secondary schools and 57% of primary schools used to use TLRs regularly. Now, what is a TLR if not a recognition for a greater level of performance and a greater level of seniority? It's differentiating pay between teachers. And I think it's important that that's an element of what we talk about. So let me give you my own three reasons uh, why I think performance-related pay can work, or at least is not damaging. Firstly, I'm going to talk about how it represents best practice for how you get high-performing people into a system. Secondly, how it can lead to better practice and focus on outcomes. And thirdly, how it can lead to a positive culture of positive reinforcement within a school system. So first of all, then, how it represents best practice of getting teachers into a system. And if you look at the private sector as a comparison, 
Only 7% of private sector organisations use a pay spine. 93% of private sector organisations recognise the need for flexibility in a pay system in order to recruit and retain. 81% of those organisations offer a formal pay and incentive scheme. Now, whether you're looking at very, very large graduate recruiters who have very, very formal systems of pay and reward and bonus, or whether you're talking about the smallest high street business that doesn't have a spine, but instead sets salary depending on the skill, the experience, and the relative market shortage of the person they are trying to employ, and doesn't uprate their pay automatically just because they're one year older, that's performance-related pay. Anything that doesn't say you come in at this level and you go up to this level 12 months later is performance-related pay. So when Catherine says, oh, you know, merit pay, it's not the same thing, we should pay teachers more money, yet that is performance-related pay, I'm afraid. Anything that recognises a way in which we need to reward people differentially is performance-related pay. And I want to talk just quickly about a study that came out in Florida last year which looked at people coming into the teaching profession during the recession in the US at the end of this century, end of the beginning of this century. Now, what happened was that in practice, as other jobs became harder to get, or in effect not there, more people went into teaching who wouldn't have otherwise done so. And the study was unequivocal. Teachers entering the profession during a recession are significantly more effective at raising student test scores. The fact is, whether we like it or not, teaching for many people is not a first choice profession. They go into teaching occasionally when they can't do anything else. So anything that can get more people in, who would not have otherwise done, you can see I'm doing well here to win over my audience, <laughs> aren't I? This is how committed I am to the principle of the debate. Anything that gets people in who wouldn't have done otherwise and that benefits students is a good thing. Second argument, it can, at the margins, lead to a focus on the things we want to see happen. Now, Catherine says it doesn't work, or if it does, it leads to all kinds of terrible outcomes. And sure, those examples that she mentioned sound pretty stupid. Now, unsurprisingly, I'm not endorsing that. I'm not endorsing a model in which people don't collaborate with each other. I'm not endorsing a model in which bus drivers don't pick up passengers. Unsurprisingly, I don't think that's a sensible way to proceed. But let's be honest, that doesn't actually reflect the reality of any school I've been in. Now, I visit a lot of schools, obviously not local authority schools, because I hate local authorities, mainly like academies, and academies don't have to do performance-related pay. But when I do see schools that have got performance-related pay, I don't see these negative behaviours. I think this is just a theoretical bogeyman. I don't see teachers squirrelling away resources and not sharing them. I don't see people dumping on their key stage three classes. I don't see people not team teaching, not observing, not sharing, not having discussions. I don't see that behaviour. And that's because teachers are not idiots. And they recognise the need to collaborate and to share and to discuss. So it doesn't, in reality, lead to that type of behaviour which Catherine talks about. What it can lead to, and what the evidence suggests it can lead to, if done well, is an input which increases pupil outcomes. And I want to talk very, very quickly about three studies that show that. The first one is a study out of CMPO Bristol, which looked at the implementation of the upper pay scale in England. That concluded that teachers eligible for the upper pay scale, which was at that time the first point at which your pay didn't go up automatically, increased their value add of pupil outcomes by half a GCSE grade per pupil. In other words, you were told that to go through to the upper pay scale, you had to demonstrate performance. That was the first time that teachers had to demonstrate performance. They increased their output in order to demonstrate performance. Second study I want to talk about is an OECD review from 2003, which largely talked about performance-related pay in the United States. This was more nuanced, and it didn't say it always works, but it concluded there are some benefits and evidence of improved student outcome from implementation of performance-related pay, there is no evidence of negative student outcomes. And the third study I want to quote is from the National Centre of Performance Incentives from 2006. The literature is consistent in finding positive, positive effects, though it is not robust on how those are designed. In other words, the literature does tend to show, not always, it tends to show, if designed well, 
a positive impact on student outcomes. What it doesn't show is how to do it well. And I will acknowledge that we don't know yet how to do it very well. And there are lots of examples of terrible performance-related pay schemes out there in English schools. There are lots of examples where head teachers are asking for ludicrous things which are pseudo-scientific, which can't be proved, which do relate in loads of marking, which do lead to loads of poor behaviours. That's not a good way to run a system, and I'm not defending those. But it's also not true to say that that has to be the way it works. So let's talk about the third reason then, which is this, I guess, positive set of, of behaviours which you'd like to see. Now, let's be honest. For most teachers in their first few years... Performance management is a joke. It's a joke because it's bureaucratic, it's a waste of time, because the manager very often doesn't have time for it, because you don't have time for it, but ultimately, why is it a joke? Because it doesn't matter. It doesn't have consequences. You are highly unlikely uh, to go into capability procedures, and you are automatically going to get a pay increase. So there's no reward, and there's no sanction. Of course it's a waste of time. Why wouldn't it be a waste of time? Everyone is responding rationally to a system that has no incentives and no sanctions. So performance management in many, many schools is a waste of time because there's no benefit to it. Now, once you introduce an element of performance-related pay, and you know that as a teacher, part of your performance pay, however judged, is dependent on good performance, you start asking some serious questions of your manager and of your school. You start saying, I'd like to have a proper evaluation of what I'm doing, please. You start to say, I'm entitled to greater support. You start to ask for high-quality CPD. You start to ask to not always be dumped with the bottom set, but instead talk about ways in which you can positively value, manage value add. You ask not to be measured on national curriculum levels, which don't count. You ask not to be measured on learning styles, which don't count. In other words, you start to have constructive conversations within the school about good behaviour. You start to have discussions about what teamwork looks like. You start to have discussions about which pupils are focusing on. You start to have discussions about ways in which you can do the best for all of your pupils. And if we can get that right, then that, to my mind, is actually the biggest gain of performance-related pay. Because actually that benefit will far outweigh, in reality, the financial reward that's on offer here. One of the interesting things, of course, about performance-related pay is, in many ways, the performance reward is tiny. You know, we are not talking about a system in which 30, 40, 50% of your salary is dependent on performance-related pay. We are largely talking about what is in practice almost tokenistic. But in a sense, that's its strength, because it's a way that says we recognise what you've done, but we don't want you to drive to all kinds of perverse incentives, because otherwise, if you don't get your year 11s through, you're going to lose your house because you can't pay your mortgage. It's actually a quite nuanced system, and I think it's a good system. So I don't think that Catherine's bogeyman is true. I do think it can work. I think the reality on the ground of schools up and down the country shows that it doesn't lead to this type of bad behaviour. I think it can drive all manner of perverse incentives, and I don't think it's harmful for children. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. And to reply, Catherine. Thanks. So, well, it won't come as a surprise to you that Jonathan's talking about the private sector. Well, obviously, they're just wrong, like most people are wrong about most things. And um, I never said the thing that he said about merit pay. And the point is that it can't be done well. It's not possible. It is inevitable the things that I'm talking about will happen. Performance rate of pay hasn't been done properly in schools so far, is what Jonathan's saying. Um, and he doesn't recognize what I'm talking about. Leave it around for a while, and I'll give you some examples later of how this kind of thing destroys companies. It's not just in the public sector. Jonathan says that performance-related pay works, but there's all sorts of research that shows that it doesn't. OECD research says that when analyzing schools across the world, the overall picture reveals no relationship between average student performance and performance-related pay. As we all know, you can get studies to show anything you want. Um, there are too many factors involved in the improvement of schools, right? And so it's really hard to judge when a school improves. Is it because of performance-related pay? Is it because of something else? It's really hard because you can have a change of head, behavior systems change, teaching methods change, all sorts of things. Now, I want to address two myths uh, that some of you might believe about performance-related pay. The first one is the pay myth. Some of you might imagine that performance-related pay would magically ensure that teachers are paid more. 
in Jonathan's policy exchange report, he actually suggested that these new pay structures would enable teachers to be paid more because they could teach 100 children at a time, which is just bonkers. Um, <laughs> Unlike businesses, if schools work more efficiently and raise their results, they do not bring in more cash. A school can't give massive bonuses because profit rose that year. Money is finite. If a head wants to pay Paul an extra grand this year, he has to take it away from Peter. And amounts are small. A bonus in a school might be 500 pounds or 1,000 pounds at most. A friend of mine works at a private school where they introduced performance-related pay last year. Next year, they're getting rid of it. Why? because they saw the bureaucratic labyrinth it created and that Jonathan was encouraging just now. Not only that, but my friend said to me, and the joke is, all you get from meeting your targets is the price of a latte a week. And he held up his coffee and he said, you see that? That's because I'm a good teacher. <laughs> Performance-related pay is insulting. Here's a scenario. Someone gives me 10 pounds, but says I must share it with you. If you reject my offer of sharing the money, then neither of us gets the money. You will accept it if I offer you five pounds, so half of the money. If I offer you four pounds, even then you'll accept it. But if I offer you two pounds, you will reject it, despite the fact that by accepting it, you'd be two pounds richer. And that's because you feel it's unfair. Human beings are not robotic wealth maximizers. We are unpredictable and we're prickly. Another example. <laughs> For years, the Swiss had been trying to find a place to store nuclear waste. No one wanted it near their town. One possible location for the small, was the small mountain village of Wolfenschiessen. In 1993, a referendum was held and 51% of the inhabitants of the village voted to accept the nuclear repository. They didn't like it, but they accepted it. Some economists decided to add a sweetener to this proposed situation and offered to compensate every resident with an annual payment. The result was that support went down, not up. In fact, it plummeted from 51% to 25%. The money backfired. Why? Because these people had agreed to accept the nuclear waste for the good of the country, because it was the right thing to do. The offer of money destroyed that sense of public spirit. It felt like a bribe. Human beings are complex, and our motivations are far more interesting and difficult to manage than those of horses who are happy with carrots. There are thousands of studies in behavioral science that show this. Blood banks can't pay people for blood because if they do, fewer people donate blood. From America to India, studies show that people cannot problem solve or think creatively when constrained by the focus of a cash reward at the end. Then there's the myth about being able to fire people. Uh, I agree with Jonathan what he's saying about performance management, but it's not because of performance-related pay that performance management is rubbish. It will not make it easier to dismiss poor teachers. If heads made use of the probationary period of two years when a teacher first starts at the school and moved on underperforming teachers, then we wouldn't have the problem of poor teachers moving up the pay scale at the same rate as good teachers. He mentions the threshold working. Teachers had to be excellent to get through the threshold, yet 97% of teachers got through the threshold. School culture is the problem. And that won't change by introducing performance-related pay, just as it didn't change when we introduced the threshold. It is clear that proponents of performance-related pay believe the myth that poor teachers are the main cause for educational failure in this country, when the truth is that our biggest problem is poor leadership. What is needed is not performance-related pay in the hands of poor leaders. Let me know how that discussion goes when you're talking about uh, learning styles with your head who loves them. What is needed is leaders, good leaders with backbone, who are willing to hold both their teachers and themselves to account. Thank you very much, so, thank you. I want, I want to talk about intrinsic motivation, because it, it was one of the things that Catherine did talk about in her first speech, and I, I meant to, to come back on. Teaching, in fact, many public services do this, and I've, I've spent my career basically working in and around public services, and it, it's, it's not unique to teaching. It's something about public services. And, and the attitude goes something like this. If I were motivated by money, I wouldn't go into X. Insert teaching, medicine, pretty much anything you want. Now, that is true to an extent. Although, interestingly, as per the Florida study, which has also been replicated in London, teachers do go into teaching when the money is relatively higher. 
We know that when the relative starting salary of teacher is higher, more people go in. We know that when the relative starting salary of teachers are lower, fewer people go in. But it seems to me almost unique amongst teachers that, that, that you're embarrassed to talk about money. You're embarrassed by the fact that, as well as intrinsic motivation, you want to be paid reasonably. And, and I just don't get this. I love my job. I love what I do. But if it didn't pay me what I thought I wanted and needed, I wouldn't do it. And, and similarly, why can we not recognise that different teachers have different labour market values? Physicists are in shorter supply than historians. Now, we could pretend that's not true. We could offer the same starting salary and watch as a load of historians teach physics badly. Or we could recognise that you need to pay teachers commensurate with their skills and with their responsibility. It doesn't mean that those physicists who come in on a higher salary are not intrinsically motivated, because in reality, teaching is never going to completely compensate for their other jobs. But the truth is that the two work hand in hand. You can be intrinsically and extrinsically motivated together. And, and this sort of self-denying martyrdom that says, my goodness, I can't be tainted by anything as horrible as money, is just nuts. You're not a bad person if you want to be paid well for a job well done. In fact, the founding principle of many trade unions is a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. The left is not ashamed about recognising the importance of rewarding the worker for his work. Why are teachers ashamed to say that on occasion they'd like a little bit more money? It doesn't make you a bad person. It doesn't mean you don't care about kids. It means that you recognise, as we all do, financial incentives in life. So Catherine talks about public spirit, and she talks about public ethos, and she says, look, isn't it terrible when, when you actually introduce money, people do things badly? You're right. When systems are designed badly, sometimes money can put people off. But again, that's not denying the premise that people can be motivated by money as well as by intrinsic methods. So yes, of course we need good leaders. What's a leader in a school spend the vast majority of his or her time doing? Recruiting, retaining, developing, managing his or her staff. That is the number one job of a school leader. That is what makes an effective school work. Now find me a head teacher in, a in the country that doesn't, in those discussions, consider the role of money. What starting salary can I afford? To what extent can I put somebody up the pay scale? Is there a way I can encourage Mr X or Miss Y to stay for some additional money? That's why TLRs are widely used. That's why recruitment and, incentives in in incent yeah, recruitment and retention incentives are widely used. Yes, you ally that with other things as well. Yes, of course, a school where you have great CPD and a wonderful school culture and a powerful ethos and developmental opportunities is going to be a fantastic school. And no, a school that doesn't have any of those things but does offer you £500 a year more is not likely to get lots of people. But find me a head teacher that doesn't use financial incentives and I'll find you a head teacher that doesn't have a very good, successful staff body. That is what heads do, that is what leaders do, that is what teachers do. You can be intrinsically motivated, and you can be extrinsically motivated. Let's not be embarrassed about it. We're all grown-ups. Let's recognise the value that money can play in public services, and let's recognise that well-designed, performance-related pay systems are not harmful, but are helpful to school outcomes. Thank you. I'm not saying teachers should work for free. It isn't about the, the, the base salary. It's the damage of performance-related pay that I'm talking about that judges the performance of the individual teacher in comparison to another teacher. Now, Jonathan talks about public sector, private sector. So let me talk about IT. People go into IT to make money, right? People also, whether they're in IT or in teaching, they want to feel that what they do has purpose. And I want to tell you a story. In 2000, Microsoft was the world's most valuable company. But somehow, by 2014, Apple had eclipsed Microsoft. Stop tweeting for a moment. Hold up your iPhone if you've got one. Hold up your iPhone, nice and high. 
The iPhone brings in more revenue than the entirety of all Microsoft products. How did this happen? People will tell you romantic stories about the creativity of Steve Jobs. But Steve Jobs didn't sit in a room and invent the iPhone on his own. He had teams of people working, creating, inventing, and somehow, like Wikipedia, they did it better than Microsoft. Ask the people at the Apple shop whether they get performance-related pay, and they will look confused. It goes against the very essence of the company. Microsoft had a Windows phone, you know, and many other inventions. They were ahead of the game and should have outcompeted Apple no problem. So what happened? For a decade, Microsoft ran a performance-related pay system called Stack Ranking, where out of every 10 employees, every team had to rank their members. Two were ranked at the top, two were ranked at the bottom, and the rest were marked mediocre. Microsoft tried to cripple the competitors, but because of their performance pay ethos, their own people were crippling each other instead of other companies. Staff were unintentionally rewarded, not just for doing well, but for making sure that their colleagues failed. Their Windows phone and many other potentially mind-blowing inventions were derailed amid the bickering and bureaucracy. While over at Apple, there was no performance-related pay. People were able, to get, were able to work together as a team. At Microsoft, team effort was destroyed. Staff focused on their short-term performance rather than on longer efforts to innovate. One employee said, people responsible would openly sabotage other people's efforts. One of the most valuable things I learned was to give the appearance of being courteous while withholding just enough information from colleagues to ensure they didn't get ahead of me in the rankings. As I said earlier, performance-related pay inspires our performance. One engineer said, Whenever I had a question for some other team, instead of going to the developer who had the answer, I would first touch base with that developer's manager so that he knew what I was working on. That was the only way to be visible to other managers, which you needed for the review. At Michaela, we tell kids that they need to aim to be top of the pyramid. At the bottom, we have sticks and carrots. You do something because you want to avoid the demerit or the stick. Then you climb on to doing something that, because you want a merit, so a reward or a carrot. Then there are the in-between stages of wanting to impress, wanting your teacher's respect, etc., until you finally get to the top of the pyramid where you do what you do because that is who you are. Performance-related pay treats teachers as if they are a bunch of naughty kids at the bottom of the pyramid. It presumes that teachers teach and try to improve their teaching, not because that's who they are intrinsically, but because they want a carrot. The irony is that Jonathan's policy exchange report talks about not treating teachers as widgets, yet that is exactly what performance-related pay does. One of the executives at Microsoft said that their pay performance system made him feel, he said, I hated the person it made me become. Well, of course he did. When he started at Microsoft, he was at the top of the pyramid, intrinsically motivated. And then Microsoft's pay structures forced him to the bottom of the pile. They stopped him from being a morally sentient human being. We don't just teach kids to read, write, and add up. We're also teaching them to develop the habits of morally sentient beings so that eventually they will behave and do what they do because that is who they are. When Ofsted forces schools to demonstrate a link between teacher performance and pay, Ofsted is saying yet again, as they do in so much of what they can require from schools, that they do not believe that teachers know more than the kids. Ofsted is saying that we are all at the bottom of the pyramid. The very top Apple executives get Apple stock as part of their pay packet, and this I can understand. It isn't hard and cold like cash. It necessarily invests the person in Apple's success. And because these guys are right at the top, they aren't working in teams. They're leading them. So what am I saying? We should hold teachers to account, but performance-related pay is not the way to do it. We need to address the vacuum of leadership in our schools instead. Performance-related pay does not work because, one, teachers work as a team. Two, it's impossible to measure individual teacher performance. Three, a targets and eat what you kill culture destroys intrinsic motivation. At Michaela, we teach because we want to make a dent in the universe. Our school's success and our own success are inextricably linked. Working at Michaela is sort of like owning Apple stock. And, <laughs> and that is the kind of commitment the entire system needs from its teachers. Thank you. Oh, damn it, if only I'd have thought about to play the Ofsted card. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. 
the anecdote, the anecdote about you know Microsoft versus Apple, how how Apple overtook Microsoft, and the fact that I was apparently down to performance-related pay, I mean, <laughs> kind of rather reminds me of the point that no two nations that both have McDonald's have ever gone to war with each other. You know, it's probably true, but it's unlikely to be the defining reason why. Um, there are a number of reasons why Microsoft failed and Apple succeeded. Um, all I know about it is the film I've watched for two hours. I suspect that's all that most of you know. I'm pretty confident in staking a flag in the ground that says it was not because of the bad performance relay system uh, that Microsoft seemed to be imposing. And, and more to the point, what, what does it say about our nature as teachers if we, if we think that this sort of apocalyptic vision that Catherine presents will happen, or to be more precise, is happening? Because for the vast majority of schools, they are operating performance-related pay already and have been since September 2014. And I just don't see it. I don't see this behaviour in classrooms. I don't see this behaviour amongst colleagues. And to think that, that the people in this room as teachers have such a poor view of human nature that they think that that is what teachers will do, I just don't think that that's true. I don't think that that's realistic. And think about your classrooms. If child X and child Y sat next to each other for a year and used to collaborate on homework and all of a sudden stopped because one of them was getting an A and one of them was getting a B and didn't want to share with each other, what would you say as a teacher? Would you say, oh, I mean, well, look, fair enough, guys. That's human nature. Look at Apple and Microsoft. Or would you say, come on, let's collaborate. Let's recognize the benefit of working together. One of you gets an A, one of you gets a B. It doesn't mean that you don't work well together. Or consider teachers in your team. If one of them said, look, I'm really sorry, but you know, the fact that I might get 500 pounds in a year's time means that I'm not going to work with any of my colleagues for a year because, frankly, I don't give a damn about them anymore, would you say, oh, yeah, I mean, fair enough, right, Apple and Microsoft? Or would you say, come on, guys, that's a pretty silly way to behave. Good teamwork outweighs any intrinsic and extrinsic reward that happens to you at the end of the day. The fact is, you would all say the second thing to your kids, and you would all say the second thing to your staff, and that is because you are not idiots, and you recognize that intrinsic and extrinsic work together, and it's perfectly possible to be collaborative and to be productive whilst also having small financial independent reward. The fact is that performance-related pay can, can, if designed well, get people into teaching who would not have otherwise done. It can improve people outcomes, it can make teachers stay, and it can lead to the types of positive conversations in schools which lead to a more positive school environment. Yes, you can find a study that shows everything. But interestingly, I'm not sure I heard any education studies from Catherine that say other than that. I heard lots about Israeli daycare centres and about buses, but I didn't hear anyone say that actually it doesn't happen. I didn't hear Catherine say, no, 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 you don't get better teachers in. I didn't hear her say, no, 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 it doesn't lead to worse outcomes for pupils. I didn't hear her say, no, 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 it doesn't work. I didn't hear her say, no, it makes people leave. I heard a lot of theoretical constructs, but I didn't hear on the ground what's happening. And that is because up and down the country for 18 months, what has been happening is not the vision that Catherine tells you. What has been happening is the same thing that's always happened in good schools. Collaborative, engaged teachers working hard but not doing whatever it takes in order to support the outcomes for their pupils. Performance-related pay recognises that and rewards that, but it simply doesn't drive this type of behaviour which Catherine said. But the fact is that if we deny, if we deny the reality that teachers have differential skills, differential labour market value, differential performance, if we stick our fingers in our ear and say, well, you all must be paid this when you start, and you all paid this 12 months later, and you all paid this 12 months later, and you all paid this 12 months later, we are teaching teachers like widgets. We are not recognizing the single most valuable asset in a school. We are not recognizing and rewarding teachers as professionals. We are treating them like bus drivers or people in a toothpaste factory. And I don't think that's good enough. I don't think we should treat teachers like widgets. I think we should recognize them as professionals, and I think we should incentivize them to work together in order to create a positive atmosphere and improve kids' results. That's what Michaela wants. That's what every school wants. No one is denying that's the end goal. It's about how you get there, and how you get there 
I think is a positive, engaged classroom, and part of that is about allowing financial incentives and performance-related pay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed to Catherine and to John for um, a thoroughly, really, really enjoyable debate. Um, first of all, do we have questions for Catherine? Do we have a question for Catherine? Um, Chris, back. Thanks. Um, it's, it's actually a question for both because I feel like you've been debating this with different definitions of performance-related pay in mind. So the question for Catherine is, would, given that there's a shortage of uh, physics teachers, would you consider hiring um, two teachers, one history, one physics, uh, equally qualified, just different subjects, would you consider advertising for those two posts, um, paying the physics teacher more than the history teacher? And the question for Jonathan, how would you deal with the issue of um, increasing an individual teacher's pay year on year, if not using the, the pay spine as we currently have it? Catherine, do you want to speak first? Yeah. Um, well, like I said, performance-related pay is about uh, analyzing the performance of a teacher in your school. So if you're using, you're out in the middle of nowhere, nobody wants to come and work for you, you need to advertise higher salaries in order to get them to come and work for you, that's a different thing. That's using financial incentives in a different way. I'm talking about the damage that performance-related pay does to people when they're working in a team and what it does to that team. Um, and, and that's what's important. It's not money that I have a problem with. It's the, it's the, it, it's the it's performance-related pay. It's, it, it's using that to... Uh, judge the performance of that individual teacher and the problem comes with how do you measure that performance how do you uh, quantify it how do you uh, how do you divide how do you measure that performance of one teacher next to another uh, to the other teacher bringing in a physics teacher well that's just a different thing altogether hey, thank you. so on, on the question of pay scales um, I, so I, in, in my view, if a school has a pay scale, they either track the national pay scale or they come up with their own, as long as it's clearly published, and as long as their pay policy says what you have to do in order to get up the scale, uh, to my mind, a, a head teacher or a line manager saying, congratulations, you've passed, you go up a point next year, that's performance-related pay. It doesn't have to be in the form of a bonus. It can be as simple as saying, you have to pass your objectives, and that's what moves your point up the pay scale. It's the automatic moving up every year that is not performance-related pay, and that's what I have a problem with, because that says, regardless of what you've done, you get more money next year. You have to have a test, a threshold to get through, uh, and to my mind, that threshold is performance-related pay. Okay, do we have any further questions for Catherine? Okay, no, more questions for Jonathan, right. Um, Nick. Hi, you criticised Catherine for the Microsoft Apple thing and talked about hardcore evidence, but I mean, the EEF toolkit summary of the influence of performance related pay is hardly a glowing endorsement of your case. I mean, it suggests that for some cost, although relatively low, it gives no impact whatsoever. Yeah, so, so I'm not going to claim to have read every single study that the EEF have, have looked at in their toolkit. My understanding of the UK evidence, which is largely what that's based on, is, is pretty patchy, which is why actually I spent most of my time talking about international evidence. The UK evidence on the efficacy of performance-related pay is pretty bad. There's two reasons why. One is that um, the, the scale of the pay award was just too small. So if you look at most public sector performance pay awards in the UK, they're of the sort of 50, 100, 150 pounds mark. That is too small to really have an impact. So yes, it has a cost, but unsurprisingly, it doesn't really drive behaviour. The second reason why my understanding is that the UK evidence is relatively weak is because it's quite hard to uh, essentially identify. Because schools opted in to do this voluntarily, it's quite hard to have disaggregated out the way in which they did it. So that's my understanding of why the UK evidence is relatively weak. Uh, and as I say, I'm not claiming it's a slam dunk. I'm, I, uh, there, are lots of there are lots of studies which show zero impact or negative impact. So study in New York showed a negative impact of performance-related pay. Uh, when they studied it in Portugal, it showed a negative impact of performance-related pay. Uh, and when they studied it in India, it showed a negative impact of performance-related pay. So I'm not claiming by any means it's a slam dunk, uh, but that's my understanding of why the UK evidence is quite weak. Yeah, just to follow up very quickly, um, it doesn't look like the most robust sort of studies that have been done have shown the, the least impact. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. Thank you. Uh, any further questions for either Catherine or Jonathan? Uh, Daisy. 
Great. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. Um, I've got a full disclosure. I've had this same uh, argument with Catherine, so, um, uh, and you probably did a much better job than I did. But um, actually, one of the things that <coughs> really rung true from what both of you said is the complexity here of designing performance-related pay system. And that's not just true in teaching, it's true everywhere. And the, the more I think about it, the more I think the complexity is so great, it's so difficult to do well. I think it, you know, it's a bit naive to, to think that those perverse incentives don't exist. I have heard plenty of stories of teachers not wanting to take difficult kids into their class because they're worried about the effect that it would have on their results and then their, 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 their PRP. So you know, these things do happen. And I just, you know, it's so hard to find a system and a design that really works. And to me, that's almost approaching like a fundamental problem with it. You know, can you think of any examples that, that do really work and work well? Uh, so look, hand, hands up, I probably shouldn't say this. Um, uh, having been a real evangelist for PRP a couple of years ago, I'm now cooling on it considerably. Um, <laughs> <laughs> when, you, when you vote, please think of my first three speeches rather than now. Um, <laughs> I mean, in, in all seriousness, because if for exactly the reason that, that Daisy mentions, I can't, I can't see how you can design something robust that doesn't have so many risks of perverse incentives. So the theory of it, I absolutely stand behind. Uh, I think that much of the, I think that much of the opposition that's raised is completely, is completely ludicrous. But I think in practice, it's quite hard to design something really, really robust. Uh, so I'm a big proponent of the theory of it. Uh, I'm not so convinced about how it works in practice. Does anyone uh, have a theory-based question for <laughs> uh, either Catherine or John? Uh, Danny. You, when you talked about, so let's imagine that it was easy to design, but you know, it works. You described your dream scenario as someone's having a conversation with a line manager, and you said they'd be saying things like, can I not be dumped with the bottom set? Does having an, an, if that's the dream scenario, that reveals that PRP forces teachers, even if we say, oh, I don't think teachers will try to sabotage each other, which relies on us believing teachers aren't people who are motivated by money or by things like that. But anyway, which undoes it, it would at least force teachers to not want to teach certain type of children or to see them as fundamentally unproductive, which is so counter everything about why you want a good teacher to go into teaching that that theoretical thing that's your ideal undoes it. Yeah. So. Um I, th I think, I think my, my, my theoretical ideal actually is, is, is less about I never want to teach the bottom set, because actually if, you, if you're penalised by teaching the bottom set, that is by definition a badly designed system for exactly the reasons you say. I think it would be more about having discussions about what the, what the kind of the right balance of your teaching load is. So for example, uh, you know, not constantly wanting to be in, in the same set as you have previously been. I think it's about, I was trying to illustrate the kind of nuanced conversation which I'd like to see happening between a head of department and his or her team, uh, part of which is around how you make the greatest benefit for the greatest number of students, but part of it is about how you as a teacher think that you can have the most impact. But yes, I agree. A system in which, um, for example, uh, you simply measured the number of A stars and A's, or nines and eights, that a teacher got would be a bad system precisely because it wouldn't reward that type of progress made by the bottom set. Okay, thank you, Danny. Um, any further questions for either side, sir? Thanks. <coughs> um, just for Jonathan? Yeah. Um, I just think that there, there are a few sort of weaknesses in the argument that you know, maybe you can respond to. Um, the first is, as has as been, just been pointed out, uh, that was going to be my, my original question, but it's the um, impossibility of designing an effective system, number one. And number two is, as you mentioned, the lack of material, um, empirical um, evidence backing the effectiveness of performance related pain in schools, number two. Uh, number three is um, the conflation that you've made, I think the false conflation between labour market value and performance related incremental value, which Catherine's also touched on, so that's three. Um, and number four, which I wondered if you could touch on, was the point that Catherine made, which you didn't address, namely the increasing levels of bureaucracy, uh, which actually relates to one of the discussions that, we had, that was had earlier about whatever it takes, given that British teachers uh, teach the third longest hours of any OECD country, having performance-related pay is going to mean additional bureaucracy, um, and thereby additional hours, and given that we have a 10% churn rate annually in terms of teachers leaving the profession, that's going to mean more hours and thereby a higher churn. So maybe you could address briefly the three, first three points and then maybe the fourth. Um, okay, so you, you have to remind me what those are as I go halfway through my answer. Um, so on the bureaucracy point, uh, which I suppose also relates to your system design point, I, I don't see why it necessarily has to. 
if, for example, you have a system whereby you'll set some objectives at the start of the year and you're measured against those formatively and then ultimately at the end of the year you have a summative assessment, that's essentially how performance management works now. The fact that if your objectives are designed properly, you are then are or are not rewarded as a basis of that doesn't strike me that you need to have more evidence. So, yes, as with everything, look, bad things can lead to lots of bureaucracy, but I don't accept that in principle performance-related pay has to lead to more bureaucracy. Uh, secondly, on labour market value versus incremental value, to, to me they are one, to me they're one and the same thing. Yes, of course they're rewarding slightly different things, but it, it is the same premise, which is, and I, I do truly still believe this, not just in in the theory, a kind of a recognition that people are different and have different levels of experience and different levels of skill and different levels of market value. To me, whether you're rewarding someone for performance in a school over a year or whether you're rewarding them when they come in because of the skills they bring with them is essentially the same argument. It's, it's recognising the individual as opposed to treating them like a widget. Uh, I can't remember what your other point was. Basis for oh, yeah, so, la so lack of empirical basis. Um, I, I don't think there is a lack of empirical basis worldwide. I think actually in the US, uh, largely because they have annualised testing, it is easier to show the benefits because you've essentially got uh, a reasonably rigorous way of tracking pupil gain. One of the other reasons why the UK evidence isn't great is because uh, for most kids, most years, you haven't got any externally validated data, so you can't really track robustly progress. But, for example, in the US, uh, there are lots of states in the US that do do performance-related pay, have done it for a lot of, a lot of years, and there are some, to my non-expert eyes, some reasonably well-designed, proven studies that show that it can work quite effectively and that use kind of annualised testing to show pupil gains. So I don't accept that it, it doesn't show empirically. Um, I do accept that the weaknesses of the English system mean that there isn't a huge amount of English evidence for it. Thank you very much indeed. Are there any further questions? Uh, sir at the back. Could I just uh, ask Catherine what your ideal teacher pay system would be, whether that would be the traditional sort of pay spine that you move up as you're in the school for longer or whether you would make any changes? That essentially, you move up. I, I do take the point to, you know, the point I made about those first two years in post, teachers need to be held to account. Um, and there's far too many that are not, and leaders in particular are not held to account. Um, I mean, you know, I would take me a long time to go into my vision for education generally. <laughs> but um, uh, the fact is that leaders, I mean, if you were to ask any of the staff here at Michaela, no one, I presume, would say that they didn't feel they were being held to account. Um, I suspect they would say that the standards are really high, high, we work really hard, we go for it, and we're doing more than we've ever done before in terms of, you know, achievement. Um, and and, and that's, that's because they're held to account. But we don't set them targets. We certainly don't have performance-related pay. We don't have idiotic performance management uh, conversations. Have you achieved this target? Boom, tick. Have you done this? Tick, tick, tick. I mean, I can't be dealing with all of that. Look, the fact is that people want to improve. You need to give them regular feedback so they can improve. People come to visit the school and they say, but you don't do graded observations, so how do you know that the teachers are any good? And I say, because I go in the lessons. They say, yeah, but you're not doing an observation. And I say, but I'm in the lesson. I can see the lesson. Everybody is just in this framework of thinking you have to have these targets and these boxes to tick, and you have to grade, and you have to do all this paperwork. The bureaucracy alone would kill us all. Look, there is another way. <laughs> and I would invite you all to come and see us do it at Michaela. <laughs> Uh, John, you have to come back on that. But this is a genuine question. So if you had two, two teachers in your school, uh, you do have two teachers, um, two <laughs> hypothetical teachers in your school, let's call one of them Joe Corby, uh, <laughs> and, and one of them Katie Bashford. Um, <laughs> two, two hypothetical teachers in your school. Do they, do they, so, so let, and let's distinguish between kind of inflation-based increase and, and sort of performance through the scale. Given that statistically all teachers don't necessarily do better after sort of three, four, five years in the profession, you've got two teachers that have both been teaching for let's say 10 years. Do you pay them more after an additional 12 months of service regardless? And if so, why? 
Well, I mean, obviously, there's a, there, there has to be a cap at some point. I mean, there is in, in all teaching. I mean, teachers don't keep going until they're being paid 150 grand. I mean, you, you stop at some point. But there are other, other incentives. So you can recognize people. You can mention them at, in, 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 in a larger group. You can send thank you letters. You can send thank you cards. You can do shared celebrations for staff. You can do pep talks. You can do one-to-one -one support and feedback. Actually, when you talk about, when you, everything you said about performance management, I was nodding and thinking, absolutely, you're right about performance management, but that's because it's done so badly. In fact, it's because people are set targets and people have to come in and tick. Performance management for us, people come in to see me and I say, OK, so what can we do to make you happier? How, how can we support you better? Right? Things are going wrong for the teacher. We at leadership are asking ourselves, well, what are we doing wrong? Well, how do we fix this situation? Right? Now, if it isn't fixable, then that's when in the first couple of years you perhaps have to move on an underperforming teacher. And that underperforming teacher might go into another job where they'd be much happier. So I'm not saying employ everybody and anybody and let anyone do whatever they want. But you can promote people. That's the other big thing that you can do. You can give them, you talked about TLRs. And, but, yeah, but the TLRs, you were giving somebody a responsibility to do something in particular. That's very different from judging the performance of your teacher. It is so impossible to measure that performance and keep it, because they're all working as a team. They're all working together. And you want your teachers to go above and beyond for that child there without thinking, well, is anybody watching? I have to show my manager. I have to make sure. You don't want that kind of play. And neither do they want it in many businesses. Loads of businesses should not be using performance-related pay. They're just wrong. And if I were running their business, they would be making a hell of a lot more money. <laughs> Thank you, Catherine. OK, we have time for one last question. Um, start at the back. It's a bit of a, it's possibly a tiny question. Maybe I shouldn't be saying this because I know uh, the chair of Ofcol is here as well. Um, but um, it's, quite, it's about the complexity of performance related pay. Um, and it relates to um, exam remarking because this all rests on GCSE results. GCSE results and A level results are out in August, but the remarks aren't completed until November. So decisions can't be made until December. And then again, the inaccuracies possibly between a subject like maths and a subject like English. The maths teacher then is possibly satisfied that their results are correct, whereas the English department, they've got some worries. How would you um, reconcile that worry? Uh, I think I'd, I'd start with making the chair of Ofqual the new chief inspector of Ofsted. Um, uh, I don't know, is she? Who knows? Uh, <laughs> I, I, think, I think in all seriousness, I wouldn't, I wouldn't base my award entirely on exam gain for precisely that reason. So, for, you know, there are a lot of teachers that don't really have exam classes is, is another issue, right? So how do, how, do you, how do you distinguish between someone who's got uh, four GCSE maths classes and someone that teaches, you know, year eight history and year eight geography and year eight religious studies and doesn't have any externally validated data or, or much less? So, so those are part of the design things that I, that I grapple with, but I certainly wouldn't just have a metric that says, well, look, your GCSE grades were this, therefore you get an award or you don't. Okay. Thank you. OK, uh, one very, very final question, because I can tell some people are really, really keen to ask them. Miss? Thank you. Jonathan, I'm a bit confused. You said a little bit earlier something about rewarding people for skills and experience. And then you said, but would you just automatically go up the pay scale? So do you actually think that teachers might get better with experience? And if so, how can you reward that? Um, I mean, isn't just going up the pay scale a good idea for experience? So um, I think teachers can get better with experience, um, but, but not necessarily so. I think, so I'm trying to distinguish between an automatic increase that says you've been teaching for five years, therefore you are definitely better than if you've been teaching for four years, and recognising, for example, somebody coming in having taught for, for 10, 12 years and having a stellar track record in various other ways in which you want to mention it. So I'd, I'd want the, 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 the flexibility and the ability to recognise experience, but I don't think we should automatically pay people more just because they spent 12 months in a classroom. Right, thank you very much indeed to Catherine and to Jonathan. Um, before we finish up, is there anyone who... Uh, was previously previously thought that performance related pay was a bad thing and now thinks it's a good thing it doesn't even include me and is there anyone who previously thought it was a bad uh, a good thing who now thinks it's a bad thing uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay thank you very much Catherine and Jonathan